Hey, this is Jonathan Gillum, host of The Experts, creator of The Experts, the guy who brings the truth to you. I got to tell you, I can't thank you enough for all that you have done in helping me get the word out for this show, but I've got to challenge you. Remember, word of mouth is what gets this show out there and what gets the truth to the people. And if we're going to make this country great, it's you, the first branch of government, the people. You not only have to have the truth, but you have to be willing to act on it. And so I'm challenging all of you. Go tell five people. Help. Tell 10 people about this show. But tell people about this show. Help me get it out there. Help me get it promoted. Let's get the truth, which you know I bring. Let's get the truth out there. And let's start the show. Yeah, I look at it, I, I view it as a, uh, in a sense, a wartime president. I mean, that's what we're fighting. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very tough situation here. is Jonathan Gillum back in on the Experts Podcast. And yes, we are going to drop the hammer down today on China. And so we've been, you know, China is all over the television and the media now for probably reasons that they don't want to uh, be all over the place for because ultimately... No matter where this virus started, it is something that is reflecting very badly on China. And so um, it's interesting that the president and the way he is using the term China virus uh, is uh, so in the face of China. And I don't think they're used to that either. Most people, as we've talked about over the past several days, don't even realize that China uh, it produces 80% of the medications that we use here. So let's say China's doing great. Let's say they, ha- you know, some of the medication over there is what's used to be to treat the virus here. It, I mean, they have the ability, they have such a grip on us economically and through this type of stuff that not only can they squeeze us with the medicine, uh, which is probably going to happen because pr- who knows what production I- is going to happen over there, or how that's going to reflect on us over the next couple of weeks and months. But also uh, something that Dr. Lucarini discovered, who's always on this show, is that all our masks are made over there. All the all the Kim bio suits are made over there or the safety gear that they wear in the hospitals. It's all it's all made in China. And so all that stuff is on backlog. The, the country is even having a problem with getting masks right now because of the fact that they're made in China. So I figured, you know, somebody who uh, I always like to bring on the show's called The Experts, people who understand the how these different countries work and especially China. And I see a lot of people in media that are, and this is, actually hilarious to me because I saw the same thing in the FBI people who are considered experts in China simply because they have Chinese heritage in their or in their blood but they're Americans never most of them never even been to China but a lot of these people that you see on TV they'll <laughs> they'll bring somebody on who's Chinese and they never they've never even been to China before so I figured I'd reach out to Scott Eulinger former CIA station chief you can find him on Twitter at the station chief and by the way I just found out that you spell his name U E H L I N G E R I've been spelling it wrong for as long as I've known you but I got it Scott before I introduce you I got to give you some theme music and let me pick up what I'm going to use here. I think Johnny Rivers, Secret Asian Man. That's yeah. what I prefer. <laughs> here you go. Hold on. This is. Let me try this. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Well, I've used that one before. Hold on. Let's see here. I think that's a pretty good one. I use that on my commercial. Ladies and gentlemen, the CIA Station Chief, the CIA Station Chief of CIA Station Chiefs, Scott Eulinger. 
Also known as 0016, I think. Isn't that what, what it was? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. You know, I was I, one of the posts I just made on Twitter is how, and you know this as well as I do, when you're put in terrible situations, a sense of humor, you got to have a sense of humor. You absolutely have to have it. And, and I, I'm famous for my black sense of humor. Exactly. <laughs> so you got to have it, man. And, and, and that way, if, if, if you get whacked, at least people are going to say, you know, that guy had a good sense of humor was always my <laughs> attitude. You know, like you've got the quick quip, like movie, like quip, James Bond, like quip or Schwarzenegger clip quip right before you get whacked. Yeah. Okay. Well, people are going to remember that. So, right. okay. So <clears throat> I gave you my take, uh, on just a little bit of a take on China and, and the reality of, how they have a grip. We've been talking about that a lot on this show. Sure. What do you think, um, or what is your overall take, not just on the virus? Let, let's, okay, we'll, we'll discuss whether or not the virus was man-made or not. I know a lot of doctors that are people, that, again, experts on TV are saying right. it was not man-made. Um, what I want to look at is, who is China in this game of globalism and this game of... Uh, dependency that they how have they crafted this and is it just because they just make products cheaper and so that literally has been the callist of catalyst of of people becoming dependent on them and that's a side effect of globalism it, it what is the potential right that that grip could have and how this is i think the real important thing scott how nefarious is china you know Back a thousand years ago, if somebody had this kind of leverage, there was no doubt they were going to go to war and try to take over places. Right. Exactly. The, um, you know, this I just want to put it out there for people, but, um, I was concerned about the coronavirus when almost literally very few people had heard about it. The minute things started coming out of China, I started watching it very carefully. I was the guy who was visiting the supermarket five weeks ago telling the cashier there's something going on. And now of course it's on the lips of every American. And, you know, I'm just sitting here in like my little bunker in, uh, you know, rural Pennsylvania with the Amish hanging out and, you know, enjoying life because I understand the way the Chinese operate and the threats that they have posed, you know, the Chinese dominance of our pharmaceuticals and things like that is something I've known about for years. And that's why I was looking at the coronavirus with some concern, because I could understand the, the economic implications of these things. The good thing is that now the American people are basically seeing that everything that the president has been saying for more than three years is absolutely true. Now explain that. You know, explain that because okay. what, what, because what from trolls, the beginning, well, let me say this real quick. The trolls are out of control on social media and they are trying to counter everything everything anybody says good about Trump and they're throwing out stuff that he's failed, that all this is his fault. But so explain that. The, you know, president Trump since both way before he was president was very wary of the role of China. Now this is one, uh, you know, American business and European business because solely pursuing the profit motive and actually not being very smart about it understanding like basically like we live in the, in a post millennium era where history doesn't matter, where ethnic rivalry doesn't matter, where, where nothing matters except the pursuit of profit. But there's a lot of people who don't think that way. And that's the way the Chinese are. And they took advantage of the Europeans and Americans naivete to say, Oh, you know, build your factories here. You know, we'll make things easy for you. You'll enter partnerships. Of course we'll rob you blind, but we'll, you know, you, you'll find that out yourself later, mm -hmm. things like that. And led the West on a primrose path that fooled Republicans and Democrats alike. And also sometimes it didn't fool them, but these people, you know, politicians and businessmen just took the money where it's not just Hunter Biden who's making hundreds of millions off of these people, but these people bought a tremendous amount of influence over decades. And right. now the chickens are coming home to roost and it's, and, and but the good thing is that I think the American people have woken up on one book if I haven't mentioned it before is that everyone's got to read is it's called the hundred year marathon and it's by a guy named Michael, Michael Pillsbury. I'm looking at it right now in my bookshelf. And this guy is a, is unusual for a Caucasian because he's a fluent and a uh, speaker and reader and writer of Chinese. That's a very rare thing. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, this is like to show you how China is, it's way different than Russia or any other country like that is that, the Chinese can depend on very few people 
even understanding how they think because so few people understand their language. Mm -hmm. So for example, I know, I remember in the book, Pillsbury talks about, you know, asking to look at unclassified documents that were unbelievable in the things that they said, but the Chinese are, have become so complacent and arrogant that, well, none of these people want to understand us and they can't understand us. So we can just basically write whatever we want. Mm-hmm. And so all of these, they're, they're, they're disdain for the West, for our values. All of this stuff is, there is huge amounts of evidence out there for a decade or more that they, they held us in contempt. Mm-hmm. And people like Michael Pillsbury were sounding the alarm, you know, almost 10 years ago. And now we're finally waking up to what we are truly confronting in China, a communist dictatorship that has little regard for human life, that thinks nothing of creating million man Uyghur re-education camps in the West that harvests organs of political prisoners, much as any Falun Gong member in San Francisco or New York City would have told you 15 years ago if you were willing to listen. Now, I did listen to those people, and now we're finding out more and more that, you know, those people were right. And, yeah. you know, the, the press, the, the, the China-friendly press and all this stuff, we're wrong, you know, uh, that, that, you know, oh, we're going to, and also it shows the arrogance of the West. Well, see, if we get them into international organizations, see inside of every Chinese person, there's an American screaming to get out like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we get them into the WTO and international organizations, they're going to be just like us. Well, they're not going to be just like us because they're not, they're Chinese. They have a strict sense of nation, nationhood, ethnicity, and history and border they don't control want to be like us and border right? and information like control. Us. Yeah, that's right. And so what, but I, the good news on the horizon, I think with all of this stuff is that, and, and this is the good news is that even ironically, I, I was going to write stuff about this before, but, and, but even before the coronavirus, it was clear that what had happened was there has been a sea change in the way that Americans and even uh, Europeans perceive the Chinese. Like two or two and a half, three years ago, we wouldn't even have been having this conversation or maybe we would have, but everyone else would have been like, those guys are foil heads. Mm-hmm. But nowadays people understand what is, what is really going on. And president Trump has been a huge part of reshaping that narrative. It's kind of like turning an oil tanker. It takes a long time to change it. And, or like looking at the hands of a clock, you don't see the move, but they do. So like where we are right now with China, it's hard to believe, but we were 180 degrees out two years ago. And that is how fast the world perception of China has changed in two years. Basically, their plans have been thoroughly derailed. So you think, do you, do you how, so, how, so did, how, is, how, go ahead. Ahead. well, how bad is this on, on China overall? I, I see where you're, people are starting to realize that China is like the trinket maker. Like they, they make everything that we need, but it's not made as well if it's, as if it was made here because it's made in bulk over there. It's made by people who are basically getting slave labor. Well, I guess, I guess you've heard, you've heard the joke, right? Coronavirus is the only thing that came out of China that a month later is still working. <laughs> but, but, um, but it's really, but it's true. See the Chinese, they're, they're, they're not the way they are as a people, the way their leadership is They're You know, they always say it, the oldest, you know, stereotype, but oh, they're a patient people. Well, they are. And they have basically hoped to rely on guile and kind of stealth and incrementalism. They slowly do things. And before you know it, it's done. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like for instance, they take over little islands in the South China sea and you don't do anything about it. Cause it's just some little atoll mm-hmm. who cares. And then three years from now, there's a big Chinese fly flying there and you're like, Oh, well it's too late now. And that's how they, that's how they work. They operate by stealth. And so they've done that for many years and they've been very successful at it. Mm-hmm. But what's happened now is we are onto their game. We meaning not only the president, but, leaders in Europe are even onto it and businessmen are now onto it as their bottom line is going to start being hurt by this stuff. Right. And so now it's not now you're going to be looked upon as a monumental sucker. If you think that, you know, China is the solution to all your production problems as a, as a company or whatever. So 
That's so what this I is all good news. This is good news for the United States and the West. And this is, and I'm telling you right now, the Chinese Central Committee meetings, they are furious at all of this. Right. That part of it is going to be blaming on Xi. Part of it is the chairman blaming on him. Some of it is just like what our plans were going so well and you know, the good Lord took a hand, whether it was coronavirus, whether it's our own carelessness with releasing something from a lab, like our own cleverness has screwed us over. You see, and you, the world is on to us. When now. you when you say cleverness of releasing something from a lab, you're not you're insinuating that that came from here. No, 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 no. No, I, I, I was saying more than a month ago, it seems, and I've been doing actually a fair amount of reading this for investment purposes mm-hmm. in, in bi- vaccines and stuff, that there are a lot of elements uh DNA elements and uh, genetic elements of, uh, for instance, HIV that's present in this virus that was not in SARS or MERS, which are also coronaviruses. That may explain. Level- so that explains why they they somebody said that malaria or some HIV drugs have shown. That's right. Uh, they, they are effective in yeah. Vietnam. There was some testing, and they they had. That's right. But what I'm saying is, if you really think about it. I, and I'm not even. I'm not going to go so far as to say this is a bioweapon, at least. But I'm going to say that this is the only level four virology lab in Asia is in Wuhan, China. The only one, as far mm-hmm. as I know. Mm-hmm. And so it's more than a coincidence that it was there. Plus, I think this lab had been written up because, like a lot of things in China, it's not well run. It doesn't work that well. Like those hospitals they built in like three minutes that you know have practically don't have running water in them. That now they're probably going to just blow up because they're cured now and it, their hospitals are useless as buildings. Right. You know these. This is this is how they operate. Yeah, I would. And, be, um, speaking of speaking of that, uh, they're going to send the um, the Navy ship Mercy here. It's going to be docked, which is uh, actually really cool in the Hudson River, and uh, they're going to use that if need be. But I, we have so many ships um, where they can manufacture, and a lot of these big cities are are littoral, which means they're right on the coast. They could literally utilize a lot of these ships. Um, that are decommissioned right. for this stuff. And we have, I don't think people yeah, realize how many decommissioned. Way, I'll, I'll give you a personal story. People don't know because of my maritime background, but I was actually for a brief period, about a month in 1996, I was in charge of the USNS Mercy, which is the sister ship of the Comfort on right. the West Coast. So in other words, I was in charge of the scheduling for that vessel. A, wow. It's a TAA, it's an auxiliary hospital. It's ship. like a thousand, each, thousand beds, a thousand, a thousand beds. beds. Each one of, we'll put it this way, this is 20 old information from when I did the job, but 20 years ago, each one of those ships was the fifth largest hospital in the United States. Wow. So <laughs> that's actually, that ship, it's, a, it's a really fascinating. So I went on a tour, it has like three CAT scan machines in it. That ship was actually an oil tanker. Wow. That they converted to a hospital ship. So instead of having tanks that are, you know, a hundred feet by a hundred feet by 80 feet tall, full of gas, they removed that, degassed it, and they made a hospital facility. Wow, that's incredible. You can imagine that kind of conversion job, which yeah. is unbelievable. So those ships are really, um, are really fantastic. And they were always designed to, um, basically go to crisis areas and stuff. Well, now the crisis area happens to be here. Uh, on 9-11, I think they, they sent it to New York Harbor as well, although they didn't have a use for it because yeah. they thought they'd have a lot of wounded and they were just dead. So let me, but, um, let, let, let me get a good idea to have that. Let's get back to this real quick with China before we uh, yeah. lose that. So um, now w- with what's going on uh, with these this, this tension that is here and this prevalent and China using their propaganda because people don't realize that they're a closed nation. You're not going to bring in propaganda and subvert them. Whatever Trump says is going to their leadership. It's not going to go to their people necessarily. And it's not going right. to be widespread. That's one of the reasons why they, you know, a, a communist regime will last so long because they clamp down on any information getting in. So the question I have for you is here. I keep hearing the media, which I think is a huge national security threat. And I really do think that mainstream media and this White House press corps should be clamped down. I think the president should be giving briefs every day and that's it. That he should not be taking questions. I don't even believe in the, in the, the press corps to tell you the truth, but that's my own thing. Right, right. Exactly. But, but um, when you see this stuff, how similar is it to the propaganda that you've seen you know, when you were in the CIA, I mean, this, the questions that they ask are inflammatory and have nothing to do with 
the, the people that are on that podium to try and reassure and calm the people and educate them on what they've found out. How ridiculous is that? It, it, it is. It is ridiculous. And also, like, look at China's assault on the – like, basically, China is taking the lead, you know, mm-hmm. like that old T-shirt that says, you know, make counter accusations and stuff to cover up their own misdeeds. They're all quickly – they're starting to blame the U.S. Army and the United States for this. Yeah. It's, it's like, and hacked see, HHS. That, they hacked uh, HHS. Right. A, right a, paranoid, a paranoid communist regime. See, doing something like that is yet another thing on the scale of this was not from an animal um, market. This was an, uh, likely an accident, but it's clear that they're so vehemently counter accusing the United States that they have something to cover up. What do you think? And, and, and so, and so th- this is another piece of evidence on the side of that this was a screw up of that virology lab because they are so vehemently counter accusing other people because they're so desperately right. afraid that they themselves are going to, you know, be accused of this. So it'll be very interesting. Hopefully we'll have eventually a year from now, uh, uh, an international UN sponsored investigation of this or how it happened. And, um, and we'll see how much China wants to cooperate with that. It, when we look at uh, the way that they are reacting, what do you think would have happened? Well, l- let me let me ask this first. I'm going to ask two different questions. First of all, from a um, a standpoint of you know spycraft and the way that you've worked before, when we and I worked in um, Asian, let's just say I was in on, on an Asian squad in the FBI. I did in, in investigations of Asian groups, right? What I saw over here was that the people that are coming over here illegally uh, are not the 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 high class of the upper class and upper crest uh, of Of the of China. These are people that are trying to escape from that uh, way of life. But what I find very interesting is that they don't come here and change their way of life. They live as peasants here. You go to Chinatown, you go into one of these uh, walk-up apartments, there'll be 12 people living in a tiny apartment and it is destroyed. Rotten food, feces, and urine. And so the question I guess I have is, are these people themselves, could they be used by China? I mean, in other words, are they being sent here potentially? Some of, not all of them. I'm not trying to say that anything racist, which I think is absolutely stupid that people are trying to say what Trump is doing, battling them, is racist. <laughs> but um, do do you think that it's possible that uh, this counter spy or uh, counterintelligence or subversive war that they're putting people over here that you know could spread infections or people that uh, you know could start some kind of right. offensive in a situation like it, this? It's, it's certainly it, it's certainly possible. By the way, you might not have read this, but today or yesterday there was a news item that they arrested some kind of Chinese tour guide on the West Coast. I, maybe it was LA, I can't remember. And he was being used as a courier for secret information. The Chinese intelligence service was using this Chinese American. They just grabbed him. Now, he was like, he was the kind of guy like the Rosenbergs. In other words, you don't want your valuable U.S. source who works in the in Sacramento or whatever in the in the, in the um, legislature to meet with an MSS Chinese intelligence officer. So what you do is you use a cutout. You use some whatever some regular run of the mill guy who is a Chinese tour. Uh, maybe he, he tours Chinese visiting Chinese tourists. And so your legislator or whoever he is, a guy who works for um, you know an aerospace corporation, meets with this Chinese American guy. And then that guy gives the information to the MSS agent. They just arrested a guy for that today. I read. Interesting. So like this is so this is stuff again. This is you know or you know what's the name? Um, the congresswoman um, who had you know a Chinese driver. I mean you know espionage is their way of life. You know sometimes right. Chinese. Uh, I've done a fair amount of reading on Chinese intelligence. Sometimes their intelligence priorities are kind of weird. Mm-hmm. But to us, a democracy, they may be kind of strange, but to a, a communist dictatorship, 
they maybe have some resonance. Like maybe, you know, they really, like for instance, maybe something that they want intelligence on is how are public perceptions of China changing in the United States? I mean, it may sound like a stupid thing. Like a CIA would say, yeah, go around, Scott, gather information on if people are less or more pro-American. But right. maybe that might be something the Chinese want because, you know, a communist regime is a totally different animal and they have totally different needs. They have different priorities. And that's why, that's why Americans were, we have made mistakes for decades because we mirror image these people. We think these people's priorities are the same as our own. <laughs> and sometimes they don't even resemble our own because this is a totally different regime. It's a totally different culture and a different political system. They have different priorities. You know, the, the priority of the priority in China with clamping down, you know, uh, a draconian um, right. quarantine is not saving lives. The, the, it's losing face in the eyes of the world. That's the important thing. And if we got to, you know, kill grandma because we welded her inside of her apartment, yeah. well, that's just, you know, that's the way it is. You got to break a couple of eggs to make an omelet. The more history I study, and especially of World War II, I've been looking a lot at World War II recently and learning more about Hitler and Stalin. Um, and then I watched a, you know, a thing about, um, uh, Genghis Khan and his descendants, and it's very right. it's very interesting when you look at these types of leaders, these dictators or fascist leaders or communist leaders. I mean, really, there's no difference. You know, it's yeah, hilarious when isn't. it's hilarious when the left says, you know, so and so is a fascist, and then you say, well, you're a communist. They're so like, yeah, well, okay. They, they don't realize that they, they, at the top of all these groups are these maniacal leaders who, right. which makes perfect sense in what you said about China just a second ago, because a, a communist regime, it always trickles up. You know, in other words, there's going to be somebody at the top who's the most powerful and everybody works in fear. And those people are very concerned with reputation and status. Very right. concerned and in fact, with it. If they make one slip up, maybe the guy who wants to be the boss is going to take advantage of that. That's why I'm sure Xi is running scared right now because there have been enough mistakes, not even those of his own making, that could be used as a way to get rid of him. Yeah. Well, by the way, here's an interesting little thing about Xi, like these little pieces of the puzzle. I know Xi's daughter, who I believe went to Harvard. Of course she went to Harvard. Yeah. Um, is right now has a teaching position or is at Harvard right now. And somebody had written an article months ago saying it's kind of interesting that she is the most powerful man in China. He has his daughter in the United States. Wow. And it's kind of like, because it's a lifeboat because like what happens if something happens to him? You know, they're not going to just, you know, give him some nice resort to live on. Mm -hmm. He's worried about his own family. Like, okay, my country's so great that I want my daughter in America if the, if the stuff comes rolling downhill on right. me, the leader of China. So this shows you, like, it's a reign of terror all around. If you're a subordinate, you're living in terror. If you're the boss, you're living in terror. It's a regime that most Americans, we can't even comprehend unless you live through something like this, you know, the purges of Stalin in 37, you know, so these people, these antics of Xi or a Stalin, they make the antics of the Nazis look like the Keystone cops. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were pikers compared to the Chinese communists and the Soviet communists. They absolutely were. How many people, uh, I think I know this number, but how many people have died at the hands of communist leaders versus Hitler? Well, they always say it. it's a hundred, they always say a hundred million victims of communism in the 20th century. I mean, Stalin himself was responsible for the deaths of more Russians than Hitler was. Wow. You know, Mao, Mao, that, that's a, that's a fact. Mao in the 1960s was responsible for the deaths of at least 40 million Chinese with the, with the great leap forward with the, I mean, they, they, it was unbelievable. I mean, I remember reading something about the Chinese, very interesting to read about the Chinese nuclear program. The Chinese nuclear scientists in like 1964 were literally dying of starvation because of the, the great leap forward and the cultural revolution that Mao had put forward. Like the country was destroying itself and even the nuclear scientists suffered from malnutrition. That, is, that shows you how screwed. Like, if you can't even feed your nuclear scientists, you know the Soviets always managed to do that. Yeah. You know, if you if you were building nukes for the Soviet Union, you lived fairly well. But right. if the Chinese have their, their scientists starving, that shows you how messed up they were. But of course, in the '60s, China was you know totally sealed off, and you couldn't even get at it. 
Yeah, it's very, you know? it's very interesting when we look at that because uh, that, you know what that comes from, Scott? It comes from the fact that they have that many people that they can starve everybody when, when you know that the people at the top aren't starving, which is always also the case in all these different groups, but that they have so many people that they literally uh, will let their, their best and brightest starve because they've got, I mean, they've got billions and billions of people in reserve. You know, it's unbelievable. Right. Let, I tell you what, right. let, let's take a break real quick and then we're going to come back. Uh, and uh, we, I want to ask you a uh, refocus and ask you some more tactical questions about china so uh okay yeah let's do that and we'll be right back hey this is jonathan gillum and of course you're listening to the experts so you, you know it's jonathan gillum so i have a book called sheep no more the art of awareness and attack survival i always try to talk about it and do at least one little commercial here this is going to be a short one because I think you see exactly in what's going on in the world, even though this is a virus, you can still be prepared. Remember, pre, I always talk about this, being prepared. It means you, you're you prepared before these things happen, right? That's how you have a plan. And it's very easy to keep yourself out of a violent situation. It's very easy to avoid most dangerous things and in the cases of like this virus from spreading, if you typically wash your hands and have good hygiene, you're much less uh, possible of getting this virus. So Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival was written for you. I show you how attackers look at you and how you can take your life and divide it into sectors and then target each sector. So instead of saying, I'm gonna secure my life, you secure each sector. Your home in the mornings, different than your commute to work. That's different than when you're at work, different than when you're at lunch, different when you're than you're, when you're at a special event and so on and so forth. Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness, teaches you how attackers look at those sectors because different sectors have different attackers that prey on different vulnerabilities that exploit those vulnerabilities to get at different critical assets at different critical times to get to those criticalities. The avenues of approach are different because it's in different places. Once you learn how to look at that, then the second half of the book shows you how to defend and set up defenses against that, to have plans of action, and how to act instead of just react. It's got two workbooks that go with it. The, the threat assessment workbook covers the first half of the, of the, the first book, Sheep No More, and the second workbook the defense assessment workbook goes with those defenses that i just discussed sheep no more the art of awareness and attack survival is two workbooks trust me if you get it it will it change your life and that's the truth sheep no more the art of awareness and attack survival everywhere books are sold let's get back to the show All right, we are back with my good buddy, Scott Eulinger, the former CIA station chief, naval officer, probably the most well-read person I've ever met in my life. And I want to ask you, Scott, when we look at this stuff from a tactical perspective of the grip that, that China has over the United States, and you've talked about how this has started to kind of change a little bit. What do right, you, it's starting to fray a little bit. It's, it's starting, starting to, their their big narrative, their big plan is being sort of derailed. Right. So, but all like, what can we expect in the near term? Yes. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you what. That's a good question. Um, I think we're already seeing some of it. Um, there was some Chinese uh, document, I believe it was military document, where they were talking about an EMP, electromagnetic right. pulse, to disable U.S. naval forces in Southeast Asia. Um, that is an example of what you're going to see. Um, they, the communist regime, I think, is very unnerved by, see, look at it from the Chinese point of view. This is like, as the Russians would say, the time of troubles. Okay, first of all, they've got Hong Kong up in arms, and that's an embarrassment to the world. They have 
the um, western provinces, the new lands, Xinjiang, that's what new lands is in Chinese, with the Muslims concentration camps, that's been recognized by the world and was being talked up by certain elements. That's embarrassing, losing face. Plus, Trump was constantly talking about Chinese protectionism and we need to deal with China more forcefully. So China, out of nowhere, seems to have gotten this, like, you know, this three-headed dragon against them. And now they get hit with the coronavirus. And so they're starting to think, like, we're cursed. Like, our master plan, and our master plan is kind of, uh, uh, in 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the, of the triumph of the Communist Party in China, 1949, was when the nationalists were kicked out and the communists moved in. The idea was that China would be the world's hegemon, not conquer. It doesn't mean they have to conquer everything. They need to dominate it economically, culturally, et cetera. Like the way they dominate Hollywood nowadays, but they wanted to dominate the world. And they wanted the world to kind of wake up in 2040 something and say, oh, um, I guess the Chinese kind of are, are running things now. Well, it's too late really to do anything about it. That was what they were hoping was going to happen, but it's obviously not going to happen now. Because of President Trump and unique circumstances, that idea has been kind of derailed. And so now they've got to work against the tide. And how are they going to do that when the kind of the whole world has a spotlight on them? How are they going to stealthily try to dominate the world now? Well, it's going to be hard for them. So one thing they're going to do is they're going to be increasingly, incre- increasingly bellicose, like more like rattling the saber, more like a spoiled child. And I think that's what the kind of reaction you're seeing now, like the way they throw the coronavirus at the United States. Oh, it's the U.S. Army doing it. Oh, we're going to nuke the South China Sea. They're starting because they're grasping at straws. They don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think, so you, ironically, they're doubling down and ironically, what are they showing themselves to be? They're showing themselves to be a human rights abusing, uh, morally bankrupt regime. And every time they do this, these antics, and you're going to see more of them the next couple of years, it's going to solidify in people's minds who you're really dealing with. So it's an endless spiral down as far as their image goes. Now, yeah, and they'll have victories, they'll have victories, PR victories, and, you know, whatever, some territorial victories, maybe even, I'm not saying that they're down and out. I'm not saying that at all. China remains a substantial threat, but at least now we're aware of it. Right. We've woken up. I think you know, the, we're tactically aware, and that's the important thing. And I, they were relying on us sleeping. Yeah, and I think, I, I think right now we're in a very dangerous place because if... Even though we've no, we woke up and we see this, which many people still haven't, they're still saying that any criticism against China is communist. <laughs> I mean, is uh, is um, racist, and that uh, Asian Americans are going to get beat up now because of this, which I think is absolutely stupid. The majority of people in, the, in this country do not. I mean, they're smart enough to realize that because China is causing this this problem, even some of the the most uneducated people I know understand the quality of 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 leadership that china has they understand that right so nobody's going to go right. out and start especially now that's the other thing the, the left is putting out this propaganda saying it's racist it's going to cause people to get beat up listen go out into the into the into the middle of manhattan right now there's nobody there what are you going to go are you going to go to chinatown and and just seek out homes right. and start breaking and beating up people it's not going to happen that's right but remember but, also you know that that's the media that's like the left like that's the leftist media trying to try like you know a lot, yeah some of them probably chinese agents are paid by the chinese sure. or in, heavily influenced by the chinese they're trying their desperation almost shows again shows the chinese regime is starting to panic because what i'm saying is like doubling down on that when the average American, especially when we get through this thing, is not going to buy that stuff anymore. Right. Hey, so, but here's they a question know, I had. When Trump calls it the Chinese virus, they know it doesn't bother them. Believe me, it does not bother almost anyone because it's a simple statement of fact. It bothers the press. Yeah. And it bothers <laughs> the, their Chinese masters in, in Beijing. But people have kind of woken up. Right. I mean, they're not going to just stick up for the, uh, for the, like, the Chinese they're not, they're not going to stick up for the Chinese regime. But here's um, a question I was going to have for you, though, that I think the people need to realize and need to. And again, I'm the type of person that believes in being prepared, forward prepared. And you have to visualize the pot, the worst possible scenarios. Doesn't mean that you're going to panic, which I, it 
really Not pisses right. me off when I go and look at social media and all these people are like, you know, you shouldn't be saying this because you're going to panic people. Well, I'm not the media. I'm not making inflammatory statements. I'm saying this is the worst possible scenario. That's what you should prepare for. And right now, while we're under this weird thing that's, I mean, I've been stuck in so long that it's not really affecting me because I don't feel it. But I know that if I was, you know, swirling in, in society and, and in the community and stuff that I, everybody's like in this weird way right now, they're like, they, this is kind of like a being in a movie almost, but right. we are in a very dangerous way because if China did something like an EMP or if China decided to start doing, this is a real threat. If China or anybody else started doing uh, uh, multiple uh, attacks in an area right now in the United States, right. I mean, it would be the, the psyche of the United States citizenry would go bonkers for a short period of time. Maybe they would toughen up after a little bit, but, the, but we're in a very dangerous place right now, especially imagine if China came in with this threat that they were making there, this paper that came out and they did a couple of EMPs, which is an electromagnetic pulse bomb, which it's not an, as much of an explosive uh, device. It's going to destroy stuff with explosives and the blast. Right. It's going to Just knock out electronics. electronics. Yeah. So imagine all these people at home now with no way to communicate or if they got to <laughs> drive, they don't, they don't have their GPSs. Maybe it knocks out the electrical grid, which which means your water is going to go bad. You're not going to be able to uh, heat your house. Um, it, all of these things are going could occur right now, which would be, I mean, we're in a predicament right now. I don't think people. Right. We, we are, but, but, but I think, right. And I see what you're saying, but I think the chances of that are relatively low. There's, they're low. They're low. Thing, and I don't want to be, enough, I, let me just say this. Let me, not, let me, it's something you're aware of. Let me say, let me say this though. I got I got to say this. I don't want to be pegged as a tin full hat Alex Jones guy. I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say is if you don't prepare yourself for one uh, incident that you know is is going to come, you know, a virus is eventually going to be here. If you don't prepare yourself for those things, you put yourself into this situation. That's right. And this That's is right. not something new agencies. I don't care if it's the CIA or the FBI or the, uh, the DOD, not so much, but every other agency and, and people should realize this every other agency, including the CDC, they are led by people that are not proactive and they don't forward think these things as crazy as that sounds. They think you have to have a pandemic response force that instantly goes out and tries to find out where it is and where it's spreading. But those forces have never prepared the American people to, to uh, with a full understanding, if a pandemic happens, this is the way we will respond. And if they had done that, we wouldn't even, there would, we would be in a predicament right now far less worse because people would have said we know what we need to do just like if there's a fire we automatically need to go here and stay here for a number of days till this passes but right, they're making yeah, it up right, as they go along right they're making it up you're as right, they go along right about that because unfortunately and, and and that comes from the old the old mantra that political correctness kills yeah because what happens is as, as everything becomes and we've talked you and I have talked about this many times before as our society, becomes more politicized. All of our agencies become reflections of that and yeah. they become more politicized. And that means that the head of the CDC DC, or the head of the WHO is less the most capable administrator, but maybe the guy who's the most politically willing to kowtow. And that's why you have, for example, right, maybe they're not as ready as they should be. Or why did the WHO just declare a pandemic a week ago when everyone in the world knew that it was the case a month ago? because of political correctness. They do, they didn't do their job the way they were supposed to. And you see that everywhere, whether it's the police, the FBI, the CIA, or the CDC or FEMA. Because, you know, the WHO was concerned about, you know, the worldwide plague of people being fat and, you know, um, and, and, and gay rights or something. They weren't actually doing the real job of preparing for a global contagion. I have, new, I have, I have news for them. I have news for them. There's going to be a lot more fat people in 15 days. <laughs> <'cause everybody's laughs> yeah, my, my wife, my wife was saying the exact same thing. Exactly. I'm going to start running every morning uh, and I, I'm only having, and I'm only having soup for dinner, by the way. Yeah. Just to prevent that kind of thing from sneaking up on me. But, <laughs> but like, so, right. So we see, so like, for example, everyone's willing to blast Trump for the, the response to our, the U S response to this. And, um, I haven't been impressed 
there have been a lot of things I think we've done wrong, but that is not a reflection of the president who can't literally do every single job in the country. It's a reflection of the state of these agencies, right? That they are not able to, they've so strayed from their core mission. You know, the military is worried more about not training. It's the army's more worried about making sure that everyone understands the latest sexual harassment policy than how to zero your mortar fire. You know, and then you wonder why we have more guys dying in the next conflict. It's because of this kind of garbage, right? Yeah. And, and they don't have the, you know, and this is, this, and you know, everyone who's listening to this podcast knows a million examples of this that are written about in the conservative press or have seen it themselves in, in their own fire department or police department. And so we're seeing it here too. You know, um, I think that there's less now that we're less politically correct. There's more people willing to step up and do what's right under the Trump administration than under the Obama administration. But we still got a long ways to go before we, we should, we're conducting ourselves the way we should be as far as like emergency preparedness and stuff. And that's another reason to buy your book because you've got to be personally prepared. You can't expect uncle Sam to rescue you and pull your chestnuts out of the fire. Because if you're going to wait that long, you'd be waiting an awful long time. You need to make preparations yourself. Hey, let me ask you, let me ask you this. And then I'm going to, I'll let you go. We can pick back up on this. Um, Later this week or, or next week, if you want to come back on, sure. uh, I'm, I'm, av- I'm available. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not really going that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not as limited as you. I can walk in the park. I can take a walk around my block. Heck, I can even ride my motorcycle, which I intend yeah. on doing. But I. But well, I the speaking the sp- contact people doing that. The speaking gigs have stopped. That's for sure for right now. So um, yeah, right. But uh, let me ask you something uh, honestly from your analysis i mean you're, you're so well read you've experienced real communism and you've seen the reality of the world outside of the united states political system and you've seen it from the outside in as well cup two things one how controlled is the media by foreign entities that's the first thing and two why does the left and i'm not talking about the lackeys who believe everything that they hear and see it, it's crazy because i can you know when the trolls come they it, it's not that they say similar things they say the exact same thing and i can go and look at deborah messing who is in her perfect name last name is perfect oh she's a God. mess um i look at her or i look at Alyssa milano or i look at you know any of the the weirdos on the view or any of these politicians scott they say the exact same thing when we look at this, what is the hatred of Trump based on? I mean, honestly, I know these people don't hate him because he said something on a mic that he didn't know was being recorded when he was joking around about grabbing somebody. It, it, I know that is not the basis of this. What do you well, actually, think from you what just, you've seen? You just, you just gave me a little bit, maybe a little bit of a eureka moment. Like I just thought of something I don't think I've ever really thought about before, the way you're phrasing this. And I think maybe one thing about it is, okay, remember, liberalism, progressivism, it all depends on the suspension of disbelief. No, see, if we don't have, in New York City, if we don't have bail, then that's going to make everyone an honest citizen. What I'm saying is there's no one who true. there's only very few people who actually believe this garbage. They have to convince themselves, turn, talk themselves into believing it. So in, what I'm saying is there's still five or 10% of them that doesn't believe it. 90% they, they say it and they, but like it, when they're, when they're at their quiet moments alone at night, they think mm, maybe this is wrong. And Trump taps into that. Trump is constantly throwing the truth out there. And it makes these people, because a lot of them have real mental difficulties. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would not want to spend one hour with Alyssa Mal. I mean, these people are a mental disaster. And they would look at me as some kind of chimp or something. We were so utterly different, utterly different. But what I'm saying is he taps into that and he reminds them, yeah, this is a China virus. And they despise that, like, he he forces them in some ways to confront reality and it makes them extremely uncomfortable and they lash out like the way you remind somebody who's an alcoholic. Yeah, dude, you're an alcoholic Yeah, and you got to clean up and they, they rage out at you because they don't want to. It's like, it's like, you know, the exorcist and you throw holy water on the demon. I mean, they're found out they, they react in a rage. That's I think like, but in all these countries, all these countries where you've worked, you know, and you've worked around communist countries. Have you ever seen this type of 
it's almost like mind control or brainwashing where large portions of the population, I mean, look at, look at the night Hillary Clinton lost at the Jacob Javits Center and how they were, these people were so engrossed in it that they were bawling their eyes out. Um, it is, and now when you, again, when you go on social media, the, uh, the veracity of their anger is, I mean, I, it's not, first right. of all, it's not <laughs> founded in reality. That's right. That's a good point. And, and again, it's a good question, John, because you maybe think of something else I've never really thought of is that, see, you're asking me if I saw this kind of thing in other communist countries. Yeah. And you know what? The funny thing is I didn't see it. So you mm. say, well, why? You haven't seen this behavior. Why? And that's because if you live in a communist society, you inherently understand it is corrupt, it is evil, and it is wrong. And all of your life you live, you just spout the party shit but no one believes it. Mm -hmm. No one believes it. We pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Everyone knows it's garbage, but you still have to say it because you don't want to like, you know, lose your job or something, but no one really believes it. So it creates a certain amount of cynicism. It's only in the West where there, there are these incredibly naive tools of communism that these people actually believe this garbage. Yeah. There's not a single person in Cuba who thinks that the communist regime is a good thing for the people that it's raised the standard of living. Maybe it's benefited them because they're the head of security of the police and they get to have three prostitutes and a car from 1958. But wow. they seriously don't believe it's good for the population. Yeah. They know it's good for them. And but China's it's only like that. in the West, right? It's only in the West where the suckers are that actually believe that, Oh, well everyone in, in, in Cuba or China believes that this is the way and it's like, no, they actually don't. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to tell you it's all BS because they can see that you're a wide eyed true believer and they don't want you turning them into the secret police. So they're going to say, yeah, Oprah, you're right. It is really good in China. We have a great society, but if they talk to someone like me, they look around and say, Scott, our life is garbage here. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's because actually they fat. know because they know they live it. That's but very that's fascinating. The, that was, that was a good, that was a good question, John, because it went somewhere I've like never gone before. Yeah. Was, yeah. But that's what's interesting about doing these podcasts versus doing radio or TV where we were on right. the gun. You know, it, what I found by doing this podcast is that as I talk, especially when I'm talking to another expert or I'm just ranting, um, what, what was you said you had a what moment a minute ago, a eureka like moment. A, a eureka moment. So I have those all the time when I'm talking and it's like the things just unfold um, it, where you're like, wow, this is actually, you, you see things very clear, clearly you get through with the interview, you get through with the show and you're like, you just see things amazingly clear. And I, I, I you know, call it what you will, you know, God reaching in your head and talking through right. your porn and knowledge in your head. It's pretty fascinating when, especially in, in instances like this, where you have people have real expertise to sit down and talk about this stuff, how uh, these types of you know, the right question brings out amazing knowledge that is right there in front of us, but we just haven't thought about. So it's, it's pretty right. interesting. Hey, listen, I'm right. going to, I'm going to cut it right there and then give somebody some, you know, give everybody some meat so they'll, they can chew on this and then come back for the next one. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to sit down now that uh, my interest has been sparked, but now talking to you has kind of really amped that up a little bit. And, um, and we'll have a little bit more of a structured interview next time uh, to really actually nail down some of these things. Plus what happens over the next week it's, it's just like the coronavirus. They're hand in hand. As it changes, this whole thing with China is changing as well. That's right. So, hey, God bless you, brother. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay inside. And uh, don't eat any bats. Okay? I know you sure live in thing, Pennsylvania. Doctor. You live in Pennsylvania, no sir. Check it. Got it. It's okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, brother. We'll Take talk care, to you. Buddy. Out. All right. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back, folks. Hey, this is Jonathan Gillum. If you've been listening to this podcast, you've heard me talk about my new book that's coming out April 7th, The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children. I can't think of a more important time than right now in securing your children in every way of life, whether it's washing their hands or uh, looking out for bad guys, understanding that you shouldn't play behind the tire of a car. These are lessons that are going to be in this book so that you can teach your child safety and security, awareness and communication at the youngest age. The book is all pictures. 
and each picture has between three and five lessons in there that are added into the picture. And what the parent does then is we're developing a website right now to be ready when the book comes out, but it's going to have lesson plans on there for the parent. So the parent takes the lesson plans. They give the book to the child. As the child goes through the pictures, the parent goes through the lesson plan and teaches the child to be aware, safe, secure, and how to communicate. The Adventures of Team Little Bigs, a parent's book for children. You have to go get it everywhere books are sold you can get it right now pre-order but it comes out april 7th that is the way you secure your homeland let's get back to the show all right as i close out this one i just want to touch on something for a second about um i just tweeted out a little while ago you know i kind of had a a, again one of these eureka moments uh that as this virus continues uh to spread across the globe and people are doing the right thing by you know this is a this is a different type of enemy a different type of attack and uh, people are sheltering in place and they're staying at home and sometimes they're being forced to be locked down but Regardless, they're at home and they turn to social media, a lot of people. And what I'm seeing, because I don't just go on social media and, and throw things out there. I also monitor it because I think you can learn a lot about a society. You can learn a lot about the emotions of of a group of people. And one thing I'm definitely start to see is that there is certain categories that people and I put on the tweet. I put that, you know, that it's becoming more clear. Actually, I'll just read the tweet to you. How about that? It says, as the world has stopped moving and put its focus on one main issue impacting everyone individually, the true boxes of special interest that like-minded humans exist in and are divided by have become very obvious. And it has. It's become very obvious. Some of them not so good. I'd say majority of them not so good because when you put yourself in a box, it's okay to carry the box and say, this is what I believe. Let me pull out some of the things I believe in this that are in this box so that you can see it and I can take up for it or stand for it. But you should never put yourself in that box because what happens inevitably you, you end up closing the door and you exist in that box. And if it is a, especially with politics, you are, going to become a puppet because that's where puppets are kept they're kept in a box they're brought out to perform and then are put back in the box and you're never going to see a puppet that exists outside of the box it's interesting because the way i live my life you know the way i've always lived my life is doing the things that people say wow i'd really like to do that or i'd like to grow up and be that or you know that's uh, amazing that was an amazing movie you know it's incredible what those people can do i've always lived my life to do those things that's what i strove to do and that's why my my resume has all these different things on it not because i'm a braggart not because i am trying to prove to the world something you know, yeah, I was little, I got beat up when I was little, but that, that's not, that may have been motivation for some of this stuff. It always is, but I want to live a life that when I get to the end, I can do two things. I can say, I milked that for everything I could to experience everything I could in the short period of time that I was here. And the other thing is, which is a scary thought for me, because we always fail as human beings is to get to that moment when I'm sitting on my bed and I'm about to pass into the next life to be with my Lord and I have to question, did I live the way he wanted me to? Did I fail? Did I succeed? Did I learn the things that I needed to learn? And that's always been my quest. That's been the thing that drives me forward. And I don't want to be at the end of my life laying there thinking I need to do more stuff. I want to be there saying, wow, I've done a lot. I've done a lot and now I need to rest. Now it's time for me to rest. And I also want to be there when I'm saying not like the night before I'm notorious for packing the night before I have to leave. No, it doesn't matter if I have a month and I know that I'm going to go on a trip the night before I end up packing. And then I'm like in a rush and I feel like I've forgotten things. 
Well, I don't want to be like that at the end of my life. And so that's why I live. And when it comes to the Lord, I want to know that I'm ready. My bags are packed. I got what I need and I've done what I needed to do to win his favor. And I don't want to end my life living inside of a box and never seeing out of that box. It's always been a quest for me. And I would advise you while you're in this to sit back and see what makes you angry. See what makes you happy. See how much of your life you spend thinking about what you could do or should have done or what you wish you were and you aren't. And then when this all passes, make a change and start trying to be that. And if you live your life inside of an emotional box, I've lost several friends over the, over the past couple of weeks. People are very emotionally, politically, uh, both on the left and the right. And they're very emotional. And they're just looking for reasons to lash out. I would advise you to take a step back and question what you're putting your faith into. And if it's the hand that reaches into the box and gives you information, you need to tear the walls down to that box and get out of it. And you need to start looking at reality for what it is. And if you're young, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you're young, even well-traveled, and let's say you have a degree, but you're 25 years old and you've never really done anything. You went from home and high school to college. Maybe you traveled around a little bit. You may have some knowledge of the way things work. But if you've never worked in a federal agency, you don't know how federal agencies work. It, you, would, you would think what, what most of these people on the left think is Donald Trump's fault is actually a history over 200 years of agencies and D.C. and people that are in high positions in agencies being 100% reactive and not proactive, so stop acting like you know stuff. As soon as you do that, as soon as you open your mouth and say, I know, when you really don't, you literally are springboard diving right back into a box. So I would advise you to take a step back and look at what motivates you, look at what makes you angry, and take some time and think about that. Because you may not know as much as you think. And you may actually, your emotions may be actually controlled and puppeteered. And I think that that is something that's becoming very apparent right now with the number of people on Twitter that are just in Facebook and stuff. They're just freaking out. I had a conversation uh, with somebody that's a, a veteran yesterday and they lashed out at me saying all this stuff about, oh, you're, you should be in a, you know, in a bunker somewhere with your tin full hat. And then, I, you know, I didn't get angry. I came back and pointed some things out and luckily this person was level headed. And after a discussion back and forth, they, and I, and I pointed out the way that I think, and it's all on podcasts and video cast, their tune changed. And they were like, well, I'm sorry. I jumped down and you throw it like that. And I was like, you know, listen, that, we're in a weird place, but there's very few people actually get it. You should be one of them. I'm talking to you now, not the reminiscing of yesterday's conversation, but you should be, somebody who gets it and the way you get it believe it or not it's not by doing things it's by stopping things stop take a second take a breath see what box you live in and get out of it and trust me i will tell you this because i've lived my entire life this way that my friends will free you from the control of stupidity and poverty and racism and oppression when you step out of the box none of those things can control you because you are truly free and that as always is the truth make sure that you're sharing this with everybody that you're telling your family and friends about it turn on the mainstream media if you want but only listen for facts as soon as they get an opinion, disregard it. I don't care if you're left or right, disregard it. You know, what we're seeing on Fox News now is, is appalling. What we're seeing on MSNBC and CNN and the New York Times and all these other New York, po or the, the Washington Post, it's appalling. And much of it is that rhetoric that's coming out of China, which is shocking. So do yourself a favor, if you turn on the media, Get some facts if they're there and then turn it off. Come here to this podcast. There's other podcasts you can go to as well. 
uh, for facts. But I promise you, if it's relevant, I will talk about it. If it's important or imminent, I will talk about it and bring people on here that understand that exact fact. But for now, your mission is to get out of that box. You have time. Stay home. Do some digging in your mind. And remember, this is the truth. I'm Jonathan Gillum. Wherever you see my face or hear my voice, the truth has arrived. Peace. And I'm out of here. China virus, China virus, China virus. Say that 20 times fast.